the the um, oh, oh, this, the material we covered last time. So actually, let me do that right now before we jump into the actual uh, lecture. So. Uh, the summary is something like this. Here, here's just at, at the highest level what we did last time. Uh, we looked at the gradient method, uh, which is kind of the most obvious thing you would do. You know, you say, which way should I go? Someone says, that's the fastest way downhill. I'll go that direction. I'll adjust my step length. Um, nothing could be more obvious. Um, the first sort of non-obvious fact about optimization is this. While the, the gradient method actually can work quite well, if you're lucky, Right. If your problem is sort of more or less round, it's not too skewed, you know, the sub-level sets don't look like, you know, cigars or anything like that. In that case, it works, it does and can work very well. So you will see people, you may encounter problems like this yourselves where the gradient method works. Uh, for extremely large problems, that's good news because it's just so simple to, to do. So that can happen. However, the part that's not obvious is this, is that generally speaking, those methods the uh, gradient methods don't do very well at all. Um, and in particular, if you give me a problem where it's working well, all I have to do is scale things and I will slow it to, for all practical purposes, a stop. So that's, um, that, that's the summary of, of the gradient method. Um, the other important thing to know about the gradient method is it depends on the coordinates cho chosen. So if you change the, if you change coordinates, like sc just scale the variables, the gradient method, you don't get a commutative diagram. The gradient method changes. And in particular, by change of coordinates, you can make the gradient method get much faster, or you can make it get much slower, or basically slow to, for all practical purposes, a, a stop. Okay. Of course, the theory says it's going to converge, but that's, uh, that, that's maybe not relevant. Okay. So, so that's the thing to know about uh, the, the, the gradient method. Newton's method is the next one we looked at. Now, Newton's method um, is affine invariant. So if you change coordinates by an affine transformation, Newton's, you get a commutative diagram. Newton's method works perfectly. Okay? So you get, a, you get a perfect commutative diagram. In other words, if you change coordinates, you get the iterates are the changed coordinates versions of the iterates. Had, you know, it go, works both ways. What this means is that, for example, scale is completely unaffected by scaling. Uh, it is affected by scaling, but only at the level of numeric. So really quite horrendous and violent scalings uh, are required to make any difference at all. Of course, in infinite precision, it makes no difference at all in Newton's method. Newton's method works very well. Um, it has a long, the other part of the summary is this, it, is that Newton's method actually, if you look back at the history of optimization, there's even a holdover. Um, a lot of uh, Newton's method was, was terribly feared, for example, in the 60s. And the things that scared people were, uh, for example, solving uh, a set of uh, linear equations, which you must do at each step of a Newton's method. Okay? N cubed sounded really bad then, um, and especially, you know, when, and, and even when N was 100. So again, you have to close your eyes and imagine 1965 or something like that. You also have to remember that a lot of the people teaching you optimization uh, sort of had their, that was when they had their intellectual adolescence. Uh, so they were marked uh, and, and affected by this. So they still will have an aversion to Newton's method. They'll have an aversion to Newton's method because when they were taught optimization, solving 100 linear equations was a big deal. And therefore, they were, they were subjected to weeks and weeks and months and months and books and books full of things, all of which were about how to avoid Newton's method. Okay, so times have changed. Um, and we can solve 100 sets of 100 equations. Um, how fast, just roughly? What are we how, how long does it take to solve to solve for a Newton step with 100 variables. Come on. A thousand? Didn't we cover this last week? Aren't you doing this? What? Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Um, yeah, actually milliseconds, but there's only one character in, in your, your statement I don't like. The, the S at the end. Yeah. So it's, it's typically under a, it's under actually a millisecond. It's measured in microseconds. Okay? No, just look. It's the thousand equations takes a second or one, something like that. Um, and so, therefore, do your n cubed, scale it down, we're talking microsecond, uh, talking a millisecond or so. Okay? So, so the point is this is not a big deal. Now, that's not to mention the following. In many practical problems, the linear equations you have to solve have structure, like we talked about last week. It's banded, 
It's block diagonal, it's arrow. All these things are going to come up in, in many application problems. So signal processing, communications, finance. These, this structure will come up. That just makes it even faster to solve these things. So, so I guess my summary is now, uh, past, you know, maybe in the 1960s, it was very important to do everything you could to avoid Newton's method. It's not such a big deal now, especially, especially if you know how to solve linear equations uh, efficiently. So that's, that's the summary of, of, of uh, Newton's, um, Newton's method. It works really well. I, I mention this only because you will bump into people who will be trained uh, classically, and they will tell you that, in fact, two-thirds of a course is devoted essentially to attempting to get out of using Newton's method. So you don't have to be afraid of it. So that's, my, that's the summary of that. Okay.